welcome to the next installment of The Last Word in ALAS podcast. I'm Jennifer Smith, your host. I'm also the Director of Education and Scientific Affairs at ALAS. With me today is Dil Ikana Yoka Elper. Dil is an assistant professor at Yale School of Medicine in the Department of Comparative Medicine. She holds both DVM and PhD degrees and is a member of the American College of Laboratory Animal Medicine. We're thrilled to welcome Dill to the podcast today, and I look forward to hearing about her recent JLAS paper titled A Comparison of Three Anesthetic Drug Combinations for Use in Inducing Surgical Anesthesia in Female Guinea Pigs. Hello, Dill. Thank you for joining us today. Why don't you tell the audience a little bit about your background? Yes, um, I'm a veterinarian by training. Um, I got my veterinary degree from Sri Lanka uh, a while ago. And then I came here under a scholarship to do some work on primates. And then um, I did some work on, the, on primates and then decided to complete a PhD um, at University of Georgia. Um, and then during my PhD, I um, realized that that's not the way I wanted to be. And that's not my career path. So I decided to go back to my veterinary interest and did an internship at LSU and uh, joined Yale as a lab animal um, resident. That was a while ago, 10, 10 years ago. And then here I am now um, back, at, back at Yale um, as an assistant professor. And uh, I'm also a clinical veterinarian here. So um, that's a little introduction of myself. Wonderful. Thank you. I loved hearing about your background and especially I'm so thankful that you came back to us as a as a trusted colleague um, and a clam veterinarian. So we're, we're really glad you your career came back around. So thanks again for being here. We are excited to hear about this paper. But first, could you introduce our listeners to the team that you worked with and maybe explain a little bit about why you designed and completed this study? Um, yes. So um, uh, first, thank you for inviting me. Um, and this is actually a study that was conducted as part of our residency training projects. Uh, so Yale has a two-year lab animal medicine residency program. And then all the residents are required to publish a first author paper. And as we know, to be eligible to sit for a CLAM board exam. So here in this paper, the first, first author of this paper is one of our past residents, and she excelled during our training program. And this, is, uh, this was her study that got published, and now she's going to sit for the exam this year. So um, uh, all the best for her. That's, uh, you know, it's coming up soon. So we, for our trainees here at Yale, we utilize available resources to achieve a first pro uh, first author publication, and since our program is two years, the time span is limited. So we consider their interest and the time that we can complete the project. So, uh, and then the main thing is that we try to adhere to the three R concept, and that's by using available resources and using retired animals from other studies. And in this particular study, we use guinea free pigs from a previous research project. And then we compare three different anesthetic regimens using um, alfaxalone as the main drug. And it was combined with um, two other anesthetic agents. And um, I can talk more as you uh, question me or ask, ask me questions. Wonderful. Thank you. And thanks for that really great introduction to the team. And I, I really appreciate your mentorship and kudos to Yale as well for providing such a great program for our up and comers. Really appreciate that. So uh, let's jump into it. So some of our listeners um, don't regularly work with guinea pigs. So maybe you could talk quickly about what some of the challenges are in anesthetizing them. Yeah, guinea pigs are really challenging to anesthetize um, because of different several factors. They have tough skin, so they have difficult venous access, so we can't use any intravenous anesthetics. And the other problem is that they are oral anatomy and it complicates intubation, so we cannot use gas anesthesia. 
and also they you know most of the time most of the smaller animals we use um, anesthetic gas chambers but they cannot use that for these uh, particular species because these induction chambers when we put them there they hold their breath so that that for that those reasons it's challenging to uh, anesthetize these uh, guinea pigs uh, so we need to use an injectable anesthetic agents in order to anesthetize them. Great. So how about the background for our listeners on what common injectable anesthetic agents are out there for guinea pigs? And I really enjoyed um, the methodology of your paper and how you came up with some of the combinations you opted to study. Could you share some of that? Yeah, so the most common anesthetic agent used in guinea pigs is ketamine combinations with uh, xylosine. Uh, but then in the literature, the efficacy of that combination is varies, safety is varies. Uh, so uh, people have looked looked at different uh, combinations of benzodiazepines, opioids, and various other agents. And alfaxalone is gaining attention because it's due to its safety profile and ease of use via subcutaneous route. So we wanted to see whether we can use alfaxalone instead of ketamine, the conventional method, and see we can get them anesthetized. So we did a lot of um, literature search and decided to come up with these combinations that we are using here. Um, so we had at least uh, two months of literature review. Uh, resident had done a great job doing that. And then we finally came up with this combination to see whether that can use uh, to effectively anesthetize these guinea pigs. Okay, Dill, so like me, I'm sure most of our listeners will want to hear more about your study design specifically relating to your choice of using female guinea pigs. And if you have any plans of incorporating male guinea pigs into your research in the future. Yeah, incorporating male animals could have actually strengthened this study because as we all know, sex can affect response to different anesthetic agents differently. But our institutional, institutional predominantly uses female guinea pigs for research because of their calm demeanor and also that is beneficial for long-term experiments where they are co-housed. Uh, because when there is less aggression, then it leads to a more con controlled research environment for them. Um, so we, as I mentioned here, we use existing resources for trainees projects. So that's why we use only the available female guinea pigs. We do not have male guinea pigs available here, and it could have been costly to maintain them because they have to be housed uh, singly. And you know, as I, as much as I agreed that we could have uh, include male animals, most of the research institutes use female guinea pig, guinea pigs. So this study actually provides valuable information to guide them with their anesthesia plans. Super, and I, I really appreciate you tackling that tough question uh, because it's it's one that we get asked a lot with the yeah. journals as um, in the editorial team. And so I, I do really appreciate your honesty and, and giving us a, a good answer on why you use female guinea pigs and, and how difficult it could have been to use males in this study. So again, really appreciate that. Uh, so moving on, we've discussed loss of writing reflex or the acronym LORR with other authors on this podcast. We'd want to hear your study design definitions of LORR, as well as how you assessed the surgical plane of anesthesia. Could you discuss that? Yes. So the loss of writing reflex here, we defined it as no attempt to regain an upright position after the anesthetics is administered. Now, in guinea pigs, it's important to remember that um, they have, they when we are sedating them, it's become a little tricky because they have this freezing reflex when handled. So we, what we did, we wait until they lose, lost their writing reflex and then put them back on the dorsal recumbency. And then we give them a few minutes to see if they are trying to move back to somewhere because that's what basically guinea pigs behavior is. They will freeze and then zoop, they move. And here, so what we did, we gave them anesthetics 
or the injections and then wait a few minutes and then when they lost their right in reflex we put them back and see whether they can move if not we try them back again and to lateral recumbency and see whether they are trying to attempt to write themselves. And if we, they don't, then we consider it as loss of writing reflex. For the second part of your question is the surgical plane of anesthesia. So in order to determine the surgical plane of anesthesia, we placed a mosquito hemostat to the first notch on the toe at the first interphalangeal junction. And we placed it for at least two seconds to assist the pedal withdrawal reflex. Now we need to remember pedal withdrawal reflex is a spinal reflex. When there is a positive, the positive spinal reflex can be present even when there is um, uh, no conscious nociception. So in order to differentiate that, we, we apply digital pressure to the inguinal region, which is not more reliable, not so reliable as much as a, making an incision. But since we didn't go that route, we used that method to make sure that these animals are indeed coming to a surgical plane of anesthesia. And now it's time for a short break. Ready to boost your team's skills in lab animal science? Discover the ALAST Learning Library. Train all your staff in one place from investigators to managers, and earn ALAS, CEUs, and RACE, CEs with discounts for groups. Sign up for free to access select courses instantly and explore valuable resources to enhance your team's expertise. Elevate your learning with ALAS Learning Library. ALAS is now on all your favorite social platforms. If you want to be in the know around upcoming deadlines, highlights from this month's journals, or even just fun holidays, follow us on Facebook, LinkedIn, and Instagram today. Okay, so Dill, your team utilized some interesting physiologic monitoring equipment that some of our listeners might not be familiar with, and we wondered if you could kind of explain that as well. Yeah, so at Yale, we anesthetize a diverse range of species on a daily basis. We have a small you know, mouse, up to a big pig. So what we have in between rats, guinea pigs, rabbits, armadillos, ground squirrels, so many different species. So we have integrated new monitoring systems and also anesthesia systems to our routine, uh, to our routine to manage the variety of procedures we handle daily basis. So this helped us to determine which equipment will work best for our guinea pigs in this study. Here we utilize the Somnosuite Low Flow Anesthesia System, which is a rodent anesthesia system. And it is compatible with the size of a guinea pig we chose because it's also compatible with in rats. So this system also includes these integrated monitoring features, allowing us to track parameters such as respiratory rate using a passive pneumatic respiratory sensor, temperature with a fibro optic temperature probe, as well as SpO2 and heart rate. Additionally, we used a small animal or the exotic animal vital monitor called Jobet Vital Sign Monitor for blood pressure monitoring because they can use very small cuff size. And those are the monitoring equipments we used. There are you know, advantages and disadvantages. We some have some of those things we have actually uh, discussed in our um, discussion as well, but now compared to, you know, many, many years ago, there are so many different type of um, instruments available. And then if we have resources, uh, we should try to use them. So another question I think our listeners would be interested in hearing is your pilot dose determination portion of the study. And could you please describe some of the methodology there and some of the results that then helped you plan the study? Yes, um, the pilot study part was the most challenging part. I'm not uh, disagreeing with that because we had to determine the appropriate dosage using only few animals. In our case, we used just two. Uh, this created a situation where if one animal responded and the other did not, we had only 50% chance of success or failure. So what we did again, we reviewed a lot of rit rit literature to establish the doses for alfaxalone and then combination. So first alfaxalone and dex meditomidine combination. 
and then we had alpaxalone and midazolam combination where there are there are not many publications available on that um, combination so we had to use uh, some of the um, uh, some of the doses that we use for another ongoing resident project. So we try to provide enough information to determine the combination of dr uh, drug combination for this study without revealing too much of information from the other person's project. Um, for the fentanyl, we use doses that are previously published. And we use uh, when we use that dose, uh, because we used the subcutaneous drought, we didn't achieve a desired surgical plane of anesthesia. So then we tried higher dose, which we were able to su successfully pr produce the surgical plane. But then what happened, that extended the recovery time for the guinea pigs. And when it comes to these type of studies, we need to look at the look at both sides, whether it's going to be beneficial, you know, having a longer recovery time or getting the surgical plane. So at that time, we um, did not attempt to increase the dose further and instead stopped once we achieve a surgical plane in at least 50% of our animal. So in our study, we found that Alfax, um, Medas and um, fentanyl with the higher dose, we could get at least 50% of animal to be uh, to, to achieve surgical plane of anesthesia. Great. Could you summarize your findings for us? Yeah. So uh, again, as I mentioned, we compare the effectiveness of three anesthetic drug combinations. So uh, that is alfaxalone, midazolam, fentanyl, alfaxalone, dexamethasone, and fentanyl, and finally alfaxalone, midazolam, fentanyl, and isoflurane to see whether which one is going to give us a surgical plane of anesthesia and how that can affect, affect the physiology of the animal. So none of the animals of the ADF, that is Alphax, Dex, and Fentanyl group didn't reach or didn't reach a surgical plane of anesthesia. 10% of animal of AMF group achieved it. So when we, when isoflurane added to the AMF group, all of the animal achieved a surgical plane of anesthesia. So um, that was the major finding. And then when we look at all the physiological parameters, we found that AMF isogroup had a, re a lower respiratory rate, heart rate, and red temperature rate throughout the study compared to all the other combination. And again, this is primarily due to the animal being anesthetized versus uh, sedated. So that we had we took into consideration when we are discussing our results. Great. Thanks for that concise summary. So in your discussion section, you did mention body weight. And we wondered if you could explain how maybe that could have been a variable in some of your results. Yeah. So, I mean, these guinea pigs are used in a study before for a long-term study, and then they are retired. So they were moderately overweight, and so they had excess fat in their body. So this excess fat may have affected the absorption of the drugs because we administer all our drugs subcutaneously. And also we know that obese animals have a slower metabolic rate compared to lean animals. So which can influence drug metabolism. This is why we observe in long recovery time and sometimes long duration of action and slower absorption of these drugs because of having these obese animals. Um, so we need to consider when we, you know, so guinea pigs can be obese sometimes, um, you know, because they their physiology is uh, like that. So this is not uncommon. And I think that is something we need to take into consideration when we are anesthetizing them or sedating them. Great. So wrapping this all up, based on your study and your experience with guinea pigs, what advice would you to anyone who's starting out needing to anesthetize guinea pigs? And I guess this is a two-sided question for either a surgical plane of anesthesia or for sedation? Yeah, so both sedation and anesthesia is a bit complex in um, uh, uh, guinea pigs. And we need to understand 
to how to measure the depth of anesthesia, how do we may, uh, determine the sedation. That's why we had the sedation uh, scoring system here because it's sometimes quite difficult to see whether they are really sedated or they are just sleeping. Um, so we need to have a better understanding of uh, both how to measure the depth of anesthesia as well with, as how to determine the sedation. So conventional methods still seems to work best where we can study them with any combination of drugs mentioned in this study or found in the literature. But then we have to maintain them under gas anesthesia until they reach a surgical plane of um, surgical plane if we are going to do a procedure uh, or surgery. Great. And we always ask sort of a final question on follow-up studies. This one I'd like to ask is a little more specific. I really enjoyed in your discussion section, your thorough discussion of fentanyl and that perhaps using another type of pure mu agonist may be beneficial like hydromorphone. And I wondered if, if you had any thoughts on potentially conducting further studies using hydromorphone. Yeah, so um, we, we would like to. Um, and, you know, again, we are, these are all uh, training uh, studies. And then we always ask them first, what are their interests? So I'm hoping that one day one resident will come and say, um, I want to do this. I want to work with guinea pigs and then I can, uh, you know, introduce this concept because we, uh, we have, you know, different topics in our books writing down saying these are the possible precedent projects for the future. So I'm hoping one of the residents come up and say, yes, please, let's, can we do this um, with another set of guinea pigs? Um, but we also have another, you know, study that was concluded where we um, uh, compare alfaxalone midazolam combination because that uh, is the most promising results for sedation in guinea pigs in this paper. So we compare it with the ketamine xylosine combination to see whether which, which to see which one is better. And also we try to see whether you know midazolam can be substituted for xylosine because given that. Um, you know, the midazolam is becoming a problem in the illicit drug market. We might not, as well, we might not be uh, have access to it easily in the future. So we will try to see whether we can um, substitute xylosine um, in this ketamine xylosine, xylosine um, combination. And the results of this should come soon and we'll access people to readers hopefully, and stay tuned. Wonderful. Well, we will stay tuned. We'll be excited to see that and hopeful the next resident comes along with that interest quickly. So our time is up for today. Uh, Dill, we greatly appreciate you taking the time to chat with us today. Thank you for shepherding such a wonderful paper. And thank you again for mentoring the next generation. I know our audience learned a lot. I know I did too. So for everyone listening, we invite you to subscribe and leave us your comments and questions in the section below. We also invite you to consider submitting your current or future research to the ALAS scientific journals. Those are JLAS and CompMed. We also want you to follow us on our socials or feel free to email us at info at ALAS.org. We want your feedback. We want to know what you think of this episode. Finally, thanks again for listening to The Last Word in ALAS podcast. Be on the lookout for information on future podcasts dropping monthly.